What I want to do uh, this afternoon is I want to talk about this whole thing of, of call, right? Because these are, this is your team, this is most of your team. Some of them are not here, but this is they probably this have. is most of your team. Yeah, most, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Let me just, I'll probably not <coughs> use that, that's fine. You can take that one? Yeah, well, that's good, that's good. <coughs> now I will, I will uh, probably get into the whiteboard some, you know, as I go along. You may not be able to read my writing. <laughs> uh, a, a school teacher once said to me, I was about eight years old, I can remember this, he said, Wayne, your writing is like a drunken Siberian spider <laughs> weaving its way around a mountainous path after drinking a gallon of yak's milk. <laughs> That's what he said my writing was like. How's that? I remember that. <laughs> those, those words must be in my spirit. And uh, it's true, I can't even read my writing sometimes. All right. So let me, let me pray for you and uh, let's, let's uh, have some discussion. And by the way, look, I don't, I don't want to lecture you. Uh, please feel free to interrupt, and raise your hand, ask me a question, make a comment. Uh, let's get some discussion and dialogue going. Because you know, you've been sitting under some teaching now, really good teaching for the last couple of days. This is the, this is the last couple, is it? And uh, so I just want to be relaxed and let's have a little bit of fun while we're doing this. Eh? Come on, let's have some fun. Father, I want to thank you for these precious people. Thank you, Lord, for their hearts soft towards you in service. Lord, you've called them to be together, to serve as a team, uniquely fashioned, wonderfully gifted. Lord, to fulfill a particular role as part of the whole, to build your church here in Pacarania and in every other place, Lord, where you open a wide door of ministry opportunity for them. And Lord, I just thank you for their love and for their commitment. Well, here they are today. Lord, on a beautiful fine day, but locked away in order that they might seek God and be further equipped and enabled and inspired and encouraged to fulfill their purpose. Yes. So, Father, I pray that you'd bless them. And I pray that as we share today, Lord, that their hearts might be lifted up and encouraged and filled with fresh hope, and faith and expectation for all the good things that you have for them in the future. Amen. Amen. All right. It's awesome. Oh, I feel like a school teacher already. I've got all the pens. <laughs> all right, so if you are making some notes, should we just move this around just a little bit? Uh, yep. So this, can you forward, see over there? Forward or backward? Oh, I'll just backward a little bit, mate, so I can it's, it's wonderful. This must be made for hobbits, is it, this one? <laughs> all right, so we're looking at, all right, strong sense of core. This, this is one of the very important things that you will have to have in order to sustain the ministry that God has called you to do. I think one of the wonderful things is this, that you know, Jesus said this to me, John 10, 10. He said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. I believe one of the keys to experiencing that abundant life, which is a fulfilled life, a meaningful life, a significant life, a fruitful life, is to get a revelation of the particular call that God has placed uh, on your heart to fulfill. When you get a revelation of, of, of that call, mm. uh, you know, when, you, when you discover that, and that can be, that can be an ongoing journey, uh, uh, I believe when you're participating in the will of God, then you're beginning to experience the abundant life that Jesus Christ actually has for you. So this is why, you know, and I'll come back to this in a little minute, but uh, everybody is born with a sense of purpose mm. and, and, and a, a sense of call. And so you want to know what that is. Yeah. You want to know what that call is. Now let me just say something to you, because you've heard this said, I'm sure, lots of times. God has a plan for your life. Isn't that true? Amen. We've heard that. I want to tell you that it's not quite right. All right. Actually, what I say to my church is, God loves you, but I have a wonderful plan for your life. That's why I do that. I tell my leaders that. Uh, anyway, Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans. All right. So God doesn't have one plan for your life. He has plans for your life. Wow. Very, very important to understand that. Yeah. All right. So, so it's not, you know, there may be a primary emphasis to that sense of call yeah. and that sense of purpose. Yeah. But within that primary purpose are many plans. Wow. So understand that God has plans.
plans for you. Amen. All right? Amen. And that revolves around the fulfillment of your purpose and the abundant life that Jesus has set before you. Because when you pursue that plan, when you, when you look for that plan and you enter into that plan, what you want to know is that God is at work in the work that you're doing. Yes. Whether that's a pastor, whether you're a school teacher, yeah. whether, you know, whether, whether you work at a factory or in, in, in business, yeah. uh, the, the plans, anyway, yeah. revolving call, will uh, relate to within the house of God and outside the house of God. Everybody has something to do in the call, yeah. within the house of God. Yes. If every part did what it was meant to be doing, yeah. Yeah. churches would be flourishing. Amen. So, Amen. so, so when we're talking about call, just be aware we're talking about you know what the, the thing in essence that God has made me for, and I'll, and I'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. But you know, there's variety within that. Yes. There's a broad yes. spectrum within that. You can't, you don't have to get locked into specifically one particular particular thing. There may be an emphasis around that, but God has plans for your life, Amen. and that'll involve what you do out there in the marketplace. It also uh, involves what you're meant to be doing in terms of building the house of God and serving and serving the church. Now I'm talking to you though, like especially in the context of being a ministry leader. Yeah. So you're here, and all of you, with uh, Pastor Stan and Helen, carry some weight in the church. Mm -hmm. like you're carrying some sort of responsibility, and you've uh, responded to that because you believe that God has. Uh, called you to do that. Would that be true? True. Yes. You're, do, you're not doing it because Dan thought it was a good idea. Well, maybe you are. <laughs> uh, but you're doing it because you feel in your heart that this is something that God actually wants you to do. Amen. Very important for you to understand that. that this, this thing of, of, of call, you know, I can't emphasize it enough. If you're doing a ministry, if you're filling a ministry, you've got to understand that God has called you to do it. And the reason, and the reason we have to know that we're called is because uh, of what I said previously, a lot of people coming into ministry, leadership, come in with a bit of a glamour view. In other words, it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be all growth. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, it's going to be awesome. And it is. But the reality is, when you respond to God's call to ministry leadership, all of those things, you know, will be your experience. But you've got to understand that you are actually enlisting into battle, and as a leader, you are in the front line of the cosmic conflict. Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual battle. Right. And in that battle, Satan follows a very common battle strategy. Knock out the leaders. Wow. Go for the generals. Focus on, the, on those who are in charge. Mm -hmm. And that will be your experience. So if some of you are thinking right now, oh, okay, Pastor Stan, Helen, I'd like to resign straight away. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I signed up for. Didn't sign up for a fight. Well, no, you might be like the, you know, you know, when war is declared, you know, Second World War, First, First World War, you know, all the young men, you know, excited about the uniform and the, the challenge and the sense of victory and the badge and everything else. And they've got the sort of, you know, glory, glory, you know, it's all exciting. But, you know, when they got out there, <laughs> it was a different reality. And uh, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just sort of emphasizing, uh, you know, the, the the reality of this, the spiritual conflict, so that when you encounter it in the process of working out your core, of fulfilling your core, you will not be surprised. Yes. And you understand, like I said about criticism, that it just goes with the territory. <laughs> this is what it can be like. Now, the thing that will sustain you in your core when that conflict comes, and it does come, mm -hmm. right, will be the core. It'll be this. That's the thing that will anchor you. That's the thing that will keep you steadfast. See, I've been in ministry for, what, 31 years. The thing that has anchored me to that task, despite all of the challenges, all of the trials, all of the tests, all of the failures, 
and, and it's not all that, it's wonderful, <laughs> fulfilling and blessed, and, and we'll speak about that too a, a little later on. But the thing is, that's what has sustained me, Just no matter what's going on, I, I, I'm committed to it and I stick with it because I know that God has called me to. And that's why it's important for all of us to know the call strongly in our heart. I mean, I've got this little phrase that I say, I would rather, sometimes I would rather be doing something else. I'm sure you've felt like that. <laughs> sometimes I'd rather be doing something else. But, bottom line, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. Because this is what God has called me uh, to do. And despite the challenges, there is nothing more meaningful than, or, or purposeful or fulfilling or more joyful than knowing you are doing what God has made you to do. Amen. There's nothing Amen. like it. And you'll have plenty of those moments when you feel that as well. You know, my son, Justin, my oldest son, is a teacher. He's been teaching for some years now. And he loves it. And I remember having a conversation with him uh, you know, a while ago. And he said to me, Dad, I have found my niche. In other words, you know, he loved what he was doing. Now, he, you know, he, he, he loves God. And he brings Christian principles and values into that particular context. But, but, but he loves it. And it's not always easy. There's the challenges that go with it, particularly when you're dealing with people. But, but he says, Dad, I have found my niche. You know, I think the most beautiful thing in life is for all of us to find our niche around the call of God, around the plans of God that He has for us. Not only in the marketplace, but in the context of the of the house of God. So, anyway, so we have to have a strong sense of call. But let me just tell you something else about the call. In order to f follow through and fulfil the call, understand that you've always got to pay the cost. And I've already already. You know, hinted at that. You've got to be prepared to uh, pay the cost. Uh, you're paying the cost right now, in a sense. You know, you, you're given. You know, you are called to ministry leadership, and as a consequence of that, you have sacrificed this time, right? Your energy, your effort, to pursue that call, mm -hmm. to become better equipped. You know, for that call. It's a beautiful day. You could be at the beach. Yeah. You could be out having a coffee somewhere. Right? And most people would prefer to do that. So they won't sign up for leadership <laughs> or responsibility because they want to just be free to do their own thing. But you see, uh, you're here because you feel caught and you are committed enough to pay the cost associated with the fulfillment of that call and the responsibility that goes with that call. Because there is always something when God calls you, always, there's always something that has to be laid down. And I'm thinking now of people who you know, have said to me often over the years, I feel called to pastoral ministry, or I feel called to children's ministry, or I feel called to this, or that, or something else. But they won't pay the cost you know, around the uh, fulfillment of that call. You know, for instance, you know, when you're talking about uh, pastoral ministry leadership, for instance, there's an incredible cost that has to be paid. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I went into ministry, I mean, I had to leave behind a very well-paid and successful career. Uh, my wife and family, a beautiful house. We had to move from Auckland to uh, Napier. Oh. You know, that, 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 there's a cost around all of that, you know, for, you know, for family. So uh, you leave behind relatives and, and, and uh, at that time, you know, my stepfather was very, very sick. So, you know, there are all, all of these things that could have held us, but the call of God was clear. And we were willing to pay that cost. And so we were willing to lay aside things in order to serve God. You know, Jesus says this, doesn't he? When he's talking about, you know, church leadership, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. So in other words, uh, you, you know, you, you may not be literally called to give up your life. And I tell you what, in New Zealand, we have it really easy. Because even as we speak, there are people around the world who are giving up their lives, literally, for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God we live in New Zealand with this, you know, with this freedom 
to uh, do uh, what, what we do. But while you might not have to die, literally, you will be required to lay things down. It'll cost you in your time, it'll cost you in your finances, it might even cost you in some friendships. Uh, there are things that always have to be laid down, so understand that. And I love Jesus because Jesus never did a sell job when he's talking about the ministry. You know, I'm a good shepherd. If you want to be a shepherd like me, you've got to be prepared to lay down your life uh, for, the, you know, for, for the sheep. In fact, he draws a contrast uh, between those shepherds who are willing to lay down their life for the sheep and pay the cost, and those who aren't. He calls the others hirelings. And he, and, and he says, uh, you know, if you flee, you know, when things get tough, in other words, if you're in it only for your own interests, and you're not prepared to pay the cost and stick with it, you will run when you see the wolf uh, coming. Because it's under pressure you know, your real motives are going to be exposed. Yes. All right? And if you're in it for yourself, if you're in it for the title, for the position, for, you know, for, for some sort of self-serving motive, that's going to be exposed under pressure and you will probably uh, bail. Here's a little thing that you can write down, right? The hired hand only carries the responsibility if it profits him. The good shepherd remains so long as it profits those entrusted to his care. All right, so the hireling, he's just there. He just carries responsibility if, if it's good for him, yeah. if it benefits him, if it profits him in some way. As soon as it gets tough, he's out of here. Yeah. Right? yeah. But the person who is in there with the right motives, they will stick at it. They will be committed. They will show endurance. They'll show stickability. They'll show steadfastness. Yeah. So, you understand this. When you, to, in order to fulfill the call, yeah. all right, you've got to be prepared to pay the costs associated with not only entering that call, but also uh, pursuing it. So, uh, yeah, that's an important thing to, to, to appreciate. But anyway, in saying that, uh, we know that you know, when we give in the kingdom principle of things, uh, we also receive. And, and, and God certainly brings a return for that kind of uh, uh, sacrifice. Okay, here's, here's the other thing that you need to consider around the whole thing of call. This may pop up occasionally. Am I really called? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So you can have a wrong motive in calling, but, but that's one thing. But to doubt your call, all right, is an, is an important factor that can undermine your stickability in, uh, in, uh, in, in ministry. I mean, like I said, ministry is wonderful, it's fulfilling, I would rather be doing this than anything else. But the reality is, it doesn't matter what level of ministry leadership that you're operating under, there will be unexpected uh, challenges and they're going to be disappointments mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be times when you think it's just not happening it's just not it's just not working and in those times you will feel discouraged you will feel disillusioned mm -hmm. and you'll feel frust frustrated if you haven't felt those emotions already you haven't been in this relationship long enough right <laughs> be patient they will come right? <laughs> okay. that, that, that that will happen because there's you know there's lots of of extreme and, and diverse pressures. Now, so when it gets tough, you know, when things aren't going the way that you want them to go, you know, people are not showing up to your small group, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, someone promises to do something but doesn't follow through on it yeah. and, and lets you down. You know, the no-shows, you know, all of, those, all of those kind of things. You know, you'll be tempted in those moments to think, ah, uh, you know, did I hear correctly? I mean, is God really with me? Is, is, he, is he really on me? Am I where I, 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 I should be? Well, I want you to understand that those kinds of feelings are normal. All right? Everybody called to ministry leadership goes through those kind of feelings. Yeah, yeah. You will feel that in times. And I'm telling you this now so that you're not, you, you understand what's going on here. Because remember what I said, what's the enemy trying to do? The enemy's trying to knock you out. And so one of the things that the enemy will always try to do is to get you to doubt your call. And you will be vulnerable to that little voice 
when things don't seem to be working out the way that you want them to be working out or the way that you expect them to be working out. And that's when a lot of people will actually give up. That's when they will think, oh, no, I've got this, I've got this wrong. Uh, I can't be caught. So don't fall into that trap. When, I, when, when that little whisper comes, understand from whom it is coming. Yeah. It is coming from the one who wants to knock you out of ministry. Remember this little conversation. Yeah. You know, Wayne said, <laughs> ministry is a fight. <laughs> it's yeah. fulfilling, but it's also a fight. Yeah. This just goes with the territory. Yeah. These kind of things happen. Not just to me, but to everybody in ministry leadership. Amen. That's okay? right. So when the pressure comes and you're feeling discouraged and feeling disappointed, don't succumb to the temptation of the enemy to actually give up. What you do in those particular moments is, 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 is this. You actually uh, um, reflect on how God called you. This is a good thing to do. Reflect on God called you. If you're asking the question, well, am I really called? Because God, you know, when He's called you, He did it in a, you know, in a particular way, and probably in a, in, a, in a unique fashion. And I'll give you some examples. You know, Moses called to lead the people of Egypt out of slavery toward the Promised Land. What was his experience? I mean, the call of God. I mean, I mean there were a number of experiences you know, for all of the characters that I, remember, that I will talk about, obviously. But these are defining moments. You know, the burning bush for Moses. From the voice. So if Moses ever had any doubts along the way that God had actually called him, he can reflect on, well, I know. Because I remember the experience of the burning bush. I, I remember clearly God's voice, you know, speaking to me. Yeah. In that moment, in, you know, on that occasion, I know that I've called. I mean, Moses had a lot of criticism. There were people who tried to undermine his leadership and take his leadership from him. You know, Moses could have said, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time for me to give this away. Maybe I'm not called. Yeah. But you see, he was able to reflect back on that very tangible experience. Yeah. And he was able to evaluate how it was that God has called him. Now, when you, when you do that, that affirms the call in your heart and spirit. It eradicates the doubts. Yes. And, and so it's important for all of us to, to work out and think about what were the things that took place when God called us? I mean, look at Samuel. Samuel heard an audible voice. He's in the temple. Yeah, yeah. God calls him. Uh, David, you know, Samuel the prophet comes and yeah. prophesies over him and, 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 and anoints him. So, you know, David, if he's ever had any doubts, go back to that moment where the prophet, the man of God, spoke to me and, and anointed me. Yeah. Paul, what about Paul? Paul has this amazing supernatural encounter, thrown to the ground, yeah. blinding, blinding light. Yes. So, you know, look, 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 look what Paul went through. Look, look what they all went through as ministry leaders. Look at the difficulties, look at the challenges, look at the trials. You couldn't have blamed any of them saying, I, I think I might have this wrong, I'm not going to give this up. But no, all of them were anchored because of the very experiential reality and remembrance of how it was that God mm. called you. Yes. Called them. So we, we, we all need, you know, if you, what do you do? What's your, what's your theory? What's your ministry response? Uh, I don't have one. You don't have one. You're going to have one soon, though. <laughs> Obviously. No. You don't know. Who might be saying that? I mean, you're here at a leadership True. meeting. Why are you here? By accident? Okay, so what does that say? I don't know, I don't have like a defined name. Okay, but it might come to you. The, but the point is you're here. See, why are you, now why are you here? I felt I should come, right? In, in essence, you say, I felt called to come and participate in this. You may not have a ministry leadership responsibility yet, but God must be doing something in your heart. There's a call emerging. There's a call shaping because you're here. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Sarah's, Sarah's, Sarah's really good at bringing in your people. Is she? And, and she comes to our one of our connect groups, and uh, yeah, she's she's awesome. Thank you. So are you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 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 this is really interesting, Sarah, because this is you know whatever it is that God, when God begins to give revelation of it, this is part of the shaping of it. You know, I felt called to go. I didn't. I wasn't leading the church. I didn't have any real responsibility, but I felt called to go to this thing. I felt I should go to this thing. It's, it's part of the. 
what God is doing to shape your call when you enter into it and, and when, the, when the pressure comes and you think, oh, maybe I got that wrong. You go, well, hang on, no. I remember the compelling, the desire on the inside of me, the prompting I felt to, to come to this thing. So all of us, see, God, how does God speak to us? How might he speak to you in terms of call? What are some of the ways, do you think? Through the word. Through the word, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go over here. Okay, word. What are some of the other ways? It's good it speaks to you. What are some of the other ways? Vision. Vision. Vision, yep. Circumstances. Circumstances. People, other people. Okay. Here's something else. Yeah. Well, prayer, prayer, yeah, prayer. The yeah, answer, answers to prayer. Circumstances. Circumstances. <laughs> Prophecy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, God, dreams. I mean, I mean, God calls us in all kinds of different ways. Yeah. And so it's important for all of us to reflect on how it is that God calls us so that when the enemy tries to undermine our confidence in our call, we can revisit the moments where God acted in our lives and intervened mm -hmm. and spelt that call out for us and have that call then reinforced on the inside. Now I'll give you an example. Uh, I mean, this has happened. I mean, I've got so many stories like this when God has called me to do yes. certain things. Now, my call to be the senior pastor at, at C3 Halleck, all right? Um, I'm teaching at a Bible college at, at the time. I've been in pastoral ministry for many years. It's much better being a, a Bible college teacher because everybody in the Bible college, the students want to please you because you mark their assignments. You give them A, B, Cs, and Ds. So nobody wants to upset you. But, you know, the church can be a little bit different. Anyway, so so uh, I'm enjoying this. And then, and then this church becomes available. I hear about it. And someone says to me, Wayne, this could be a good opportunity for you. And I thought, mm, yeah, well, I, I was feeling kind of, yeah, maybe I would like to, but no, I don't think I want to. <laughs> this is, yeah, what I'm doing, because I love teaching, you know, uh, what I'm doing now is really great, etc., etc. Well, to cut the long story short, right, after, I mean, and several people suggested this to me. I, 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 no, no, I, I don't want to do this. Well, not long after making that final decision in my heart and spirit that I would pursue it, I heard that the church had appointed a senior pastor. And when I heard that, I felt this conviction of the Holy Spirit in my heart, thinking, I felt the Lord say, Wayne, that was for you. I felt that so much so that I actually prayed. I said, God, I'm so sorry if I had missed your call. You know that I want to do whatever you want me to do. I'm available. Lord, forgive me. Now, this is what happened. I prayed that prayer at night. I went to the college the next day. I had to ring up the church, because this is how I knew about it, because we had two students from that church in the college. And I had to ring up one of the students, probably because there's an overdue assignment, Actually, that guy's a pastor today, a senior pastor at the church now. Anyway, I get, I, I ring up and the outgoing pastor picks up the phone. And I said, hi, it's Wayne here. And he says, oh, Wayne. He said, we were just talking about you at our board meeting last night. Oh. And I said, yes. And he said, well, you may have heard that we've appointed a senior pastor. And I said, yes. And he said, well, he's told us that he's changed his mind. He doesn't want to come. He said, now, we know you don't want it. But would you come as an interim pastor while we're looking for somebody else? Wow. So, I mean, isn't that incredible? I mean, that's a supernatural move of the Spirit of God in circumstances yeah. to open up that door of ministry opportunity. Wow. And he, you know, he, I've been there 11 years now. Wow. So now I can share with you a whole lot of stories like that. That's just one thing around that particular call where I can reflect on the validity of the call as, as I remember what it is that God did supernaturally to wow. confirm it. It's awesome. Wow. But all of us need to go back to the prophetic word. What was the desire of the answer? What were the people saying? What was the scripture? How did God move in circumstances? And when you reflect on those things in the moment of doubt, the call is reinforced. And you know that you are where you are meant to be. Mm. And it keeps you steadfast. Thank you. Very good.
prosperity. All right, just helpful? Yes. Can you help me? Yes, sir. Oh, have you done something that you thought it was the call, but ended up it wasn't? And then, um, like that, you missed it, missed the call? Um, well, I suppose in that, particular, in that particular situation, I felt I'd missed it. Oh, no, I just, you thought it was the call. But, so you went on to do it. But then it wasn't. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if I'd done that. <laughs> I done that. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, know, I know exactly what you're yeah. saying. Um, you see, finding the call of God, it, it, it's, it's a matter of, of, of getting some clarity and some revelation around that. So, um, you, you know what I go, go back to if, if, that, if, if I feel that that has actually happened, if I've made a, a decision which has not been a right decision? That's Romans 8.28. What does that say? It says, God works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if your heart's inclination, I mean, if you love God, if your heart's inclination is towards God and doing the will of God, even if you make a mistake, God will work that out to bring you back in alignment and back on track. I, I, I think the bottom line is just have a desire in your heart, have a revelation of God's will and be obedient to that. And you can make a decision on, on the best of your ability, you know, given all of the indicators that you can. And know this, if it happens to be a wrong move, understand, because of your heart and the willingness of your heart, God will redirect you, reshape you. A little bit like my own story. Mm -hmm. All right? I'm thinking I'm going to stay on at the Bible college. Okay? And then I get a, a wrong call. <laughs> Give that to God, and God moves to reorganize things. So, so it's a very, and you know, that indicates a heart of sincerity. Uh, you know, that's a good question that you ask me. But uh, so, never be afraid of making. You know, don't never be afraid of making a decision. Um, you can only make a decision on the best of your your ability. You know, given all of the circumstances, the indicators of the moment. Uh, I, I think in the end, you know, it's the peace that Christ gives anyway that guides you in the decision that you make. Very good. So probably one of the things is, you know, if you don't have a peace about it, if you can't, I, I, you, you know, let me just get on to this because, you know, let me talk about the nature of the call, right? That's the first thing. Am I going okay for time, Sam? Nature of the call? Yeah. All right. That's the nature. See my writing, so I can't read that. The nature of the call, all right? Because this is what it is about the call. See, some people will say, um, uh, oh, I don't want to do this, uh, but I'm just doing it out of obedience. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? That like sort of Martha thing? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm not called to do the children's ministry, but I'll do it. I'm just doing it out of obedience. <laughs> oh, I hate kids. <laughs> but God wants me to do it, so I'm just going to do it out of obedience. You know what? If that's the attitude, it's either not the call or them. they are being disobedient. Yeah, because you know, it's all pious nonsense. Because let me tell you something about the call of God. Listen, listen, listen to this. This is wonderful. I get excited about this. This is Ephesians 2.10. God has created us anew in Christ Jesus. All right? You're being born again in Christ Jesus. So that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. To do what? Good things. Good things. Good things. All right, so good things. So the interesting thing about this is that when you, when you consider that verse, you will realize that God actually made your purpose before he made your person. Isn't that incredible? See, long ago, God prepared good things for you to do, Sarah. He created a purpose for you even before you existed. But he had you in mind. So he had this purpose in mind, and then he, then he shapes this person uniquely and wonderfully and fearfully made and uniquely gifted to fulfill the purpose. Isn't that awesome? Yes. So that's why we're all unique. That's why, you, you know, we're not like everybody else. God, God's fashioned us to fulfill a particular purpose, so it's incumbent on us to, to discover what that purpose uh, is. Now, the thing is, so, so we're all, you know, unique personalities, different gifts, different abilities. We're designed that way to fulfill the purpose that God has got for us. 
Mm. I think that's, that's incredible. Amen. So the purpose came first before the person. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? Very good. A a amazing. And, and, as we, and as we're made anew in Christ, and I think not being Christian, you can discover your purpose, but you don't enter into the, the fulfillment of it, the fullness of it, as you might in Christ. Because it's as you are made new in Christ that the full revelation of it and the reason behind it and the destiny and the, you know, the goal of it is all, all made clear uh, to you. But his will is good and pleasing and perfect, it says in Romans 12 too. So if you're doing what God has called you to do, it might be difficult at times. It might be challenging at times. But it's still good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. By and large, you will be fulfilled and enjoy it. So when people say, oh, I'm just doing it without obedience. I don't like doing it. <laughs> I think they're doing the wrong thing. Yes. Or they're doing the right thing with the wrong attitude. Yes. Because that's not what the abundant life is about. Sure, there's a cost to ministry. Sure, there's a conflict in ministry. But when you're doing what God wants you to do, it is fulfilling. It is rewarding. I have found my niche. It is hard. Sometimes I'd rather be doing something else, but really there's nothing else I would rather be doing. And that's what it's, that's, that's what it's like. So, you know, this is to help you not make a mistake if you're pursuing the call of God. Let me just give you three things and then we have some questions here. Okay, this is how you define. These are indicators of the call of God uh, for you, all right? One, it will excite, let's excite your spirit. All right, it'll excite your spirit. Wow. See, it's normal to feel apprehension. You know, if, okay, Sarah, you would make a wonderful children's minister. You'd make a wonderful, I think you should be running the evangelist in the of my church, right? Suddenly you start going, whoa, you know, like, like, <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's natural, it's like Moses, it's like Jeremiah, you know, yeah. you feel, when God sets it before you, you feel inadequate. When I first became a senior pastor of the church, I'm sitting in my office and I'm thinking, ah, 352 weeks a year, <laughs> Two services a Sunday. It's 104 sermons. If I preach at all of them, 104. But even if I don't, maybe 75% of them. It's still, you know, about 80 sermons. Where are they coming from? That's just the sermons. <laughs> what well, else has to happen around church? Honestly, you feel this like, whoa. But even so, in that apprehension. There'll be a drawing to it on the inside. There'll be a divine wanting on the inside. You'll be energized by the thought of it. You'll be energized by the meaning of it. Yes. It'll excite you. So these people who say, oh, I'm only doing that with obedience, not because I want to, they're wrong. Because his will is good and pleasing and perfect. And, and, and when his will is on the inside of you, what his call is that when you discover the revelation of that, which is good and pleasing and perfect, you get excited about it. Oh, I want to be a teacher. Oh, I love teaching. Oh, I want to be a doctor. Oh, I want to get into business. You know, I want to be a kingdom influencer in, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, you get excited about it. I want to lead the children's mission. Oh, man, I'd love to preach the word of God. Yes. You get excited about it. It, it, it energizes you. I was, yeah. When I was in, in, in the business world, and I, wanted, and I felt the call to ministry, I'm torn. I'm torn. I'm, torn. I'm keen. Let me get into it, let me get into it. Guy, you wait, 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 wait. Yeah, he's doing something in my heart and life. Yeah. You know, there's, 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 but, I'm, but I'm excited. I'm looking for the opportunity. Wow. And I'm eager. I'm, I'm like you. I'm going to the leaders' meetings. I'm, go, I'm going to everything. I want as much as God as I can get because I wanted to. It's just the divine want to. It'll excite your spirit. Here's the other thing. It, and we've, we've alluded to this already. Again, back to that. Psalm 37, 4. See, I love this. Take delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean you have a desire and God says, okay, I'll fulfill that? Yes, it could. But I think it also means this, that God himself puts the desire in your heart. When your heart is inclined to have a revelation and an understanding of his will and plan and purpose. He puts it in there. He wired you. 
He made the purpose before you made the person. So he puts it in there. He gives you the desires of your heart. So if there's divine wanting on the inside, there's an indicator of God's call, excitement, spirit. The other thing is, to uh, it will be bigger than you. We've alluded to that. The drunken Siberian spider is starting to come into play. It'll be bigger than you, all right? And we've already really addressed that. Um, it's common to feel those moments of inadequacy and hesitation mm -hmm. and conflicting emotions. Sometimes you want to embrace it and sometimes you want to run, for it, run from it because it gets so, it can be so scary as you start to think about it. But here's the thing, God never calls us without the promise to give us what we need to carry it out. So if you're called to do a ministry in the church, you're called to be a leader in the church, God will, super, he's gifted you anyway, but he will supernaturally enable you and empower you to fulfill it. You will not have to do it on your own. It's bigger than you anyway. It has to be bigger than you, because if it's bigger than you, you will then depend upon God and rely upon God for doing of it. Yes. yes. Right? That's why it's got to be bigger than you. That's right. So that you will depend on God's enable to do that. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the word says this, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I love it. Not he might do it. He's faithful. If he's called you to do something, he's going to give you the anointing. He's going to give you the enabling, the empowerment to follow it through and carry it through and to bring forth fruitfulness. He will do it. There's a promise there. So when you feel your inadequacy, you might be excited, but you're feeling the inadequacy because it's bigger than you. Understand, you won't have to do it alone. God's going to do it with you. He's going to walk with you. He's going to partner with you. It'll be you and Him. Amen. Awesome, isn't it? Amen. And then the last thing is, and this is important, it will be about the blessing of others. So we say, it will bless others. That's very important. It comes back to ministry motivations again. You see, we're all here to make a difference. And uh, you know, we'd influence people towards Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what, whatever it is that we're doing, whatever ministry role that we're doing, we're expressing and manifesting the love of Christ through our leading, through our, through our serving. Mm -hmm. We are enhancing people's experience of God. We're bringing them closer uh, to God. We're helping people find God, go deeper in God, discover their own destiny in God. You know, as a pastor, I've decided that that's really my, my role. You know how we have visions, and we say, come on, people, follow the vision. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But that's good. That's, that's true. But you know, in the context of that, that overall vision, my job is to help the people whom God has given me discover their own personal vision so that they can find their fulfillment and wow. their destiny. My job is to deepen their relationship with Christ and help them enter into their purpose for Christ. And so it's not about following my vision. It's about, hey, this is a vision on my heart. In the context of that vision, I want to help you find your vision. Amen. Amen. That kind of turns it all around you know, a little bit. And I think that's what it means to lay down your life for the sheep. It's not about us. Stan, it's about them. Amen. It's absolutely about them. Really, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> that's right. Amen. But, you know, this is the thing. Whatever the nature of the call, it will have the primary purpose of others being blessed in terms of their relationship with God and their journey in God. Genesis 12, verse 2, you know, the, the covenant with Abraham, going right back to the beginning, you know, God blesses, blesses Abraham. Firstly, in all, by revealed relationship, in his relationship with him, and, and all that accrues from that. And, and, and God says, I will bless you, I will bless you. Yeah. And then further on in Genesis, it says, and I will make you a blessing to others. We need to remember that as leaders. We need to remember that as the church. Yes. We're not, you know, we're not blessed just for ourselves. We're blessed to be a blessing to others. Yes. Very important for the church to understand that. Amen. It's not just for us. It's for others. We're so thankful that we have this relationship. This understanding of God's reality, His presence, His love, security of an eternal destiny, revelation that this is not what 
you know, life is not just what we see. There's more to it. It doesn't end, you know. And there's a purpose to it. You know, I mean, that, those things, that's blessed, isn't it? That's blessed to know that. Yes. Just that revelation, to understand that reality. Yes. We can pass that on. Yes. Because everybody out there is wanting the same answer to the question, yes. who am I? Where am I going? Yes. What's my life all about? We've got Amen. the answer. Because we've discovered it in you, Lord Jesus Christ. And so as our role as ministry leaders, you know, that's our function. That's our, we're serving the body, but we're, 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 we're having... One of the things that uh, all of us have to understand is that every leader is always following somebody. Every leader has to have some uh, one whom they're accountable to and uh, who is actually uh, leading them. So just because you're a leader doesn't mean to say that you cannot or should not be a follower. So as part of Pastor Stan and Helen's team, uh, you're following Stan and Helen. They are your leaders. Uh, those of you who are leaders, you know, even connect group leaders, you have people who are following you. You are overseeing them. They have been entrusted into your care and, you know, hopefully they are going to follow your direction, your guidance, yes. uh, your oversight. In fact, the whole principle of followership is very, very important. There was a man uh, called, uh, named Dr. Ed Cole, uh, had a men's ministry, he's with the Lord now. I remember attending one of his seminars and he said this, he said, we need to learn to be faithful uh, to that which is another man's. Yes. You know, in other words, uh, the Lord has given to Pastor Stan and Helen a vision and they are articulating that vision and as they share that vision and people hear it like yourselves, you align yourself with that vision and you commit uh, yes. to that. It's not that it was your vision to begin with, it's their vision. And God has put that on them, and uh, now God has called you to follow that particular vision. Now as you do that, you will find your own vision within the context of that overall vision. Very important to appreciate that. But essentially, you know, you have been given the responsibility of looking after someone else's property and it's important for you to understand this because uh, you know most of us uh, have a desire for our own advancement and uh, our own self-promotion I mean everyone wants to get ahead in life and particularly if you feel a sense of call to uh, leadership um, leadership is a, a journey by the way you just don't go into leadership, you know, you, you have to progress towards leadership and uh, be faithful in leadership at various levels of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it's this faithfulness in terms of being able to follow that which is another man's, which will become the key to your own advancement and your own ministry uh, promotion and your own and your own fulfillment. One of the, one of the characters in the Bible who really is an example of that would be Joseph. Everyone knows the story of, mm, of, of, of Joseph. Right, yes. Joseph, right? He started in the pit and ended up in a place of, of, of prominence. Now, you know, Joseph's particular challenge was that every situation that he found himself in was not by his choosing. Mm. Uh, you know, he was in, uh, you know, situations or found himself in situations yeah. which he did not want to be in. They were unjustifiably you know, thrust upon him. But even in those situations, yeah. he was able to serve that which was another man's. He was able to be a follower. He had every reason not to be. But he, he chose to be. And in the end, you know, God, on the basis of that kind of integrity and that ability to follow, uh, originally led him to his ultimate destiny, where he became... You know, second only to Pharaoh. And that was a result of his faithfulness, his humility, his ability to follow and to serve another. So very important for you guys uh, in particular to understand this. So when it comes to being a follower, the big issue is this one of loyalty. 
being a leader who is a, a follower, all right? Uh, loyalty. I actually place a high value on loyalty within the leadership team. That's loyalty to not only uh, the senior pastors, but loyalty to you know, the vision, I guess those two go together, uh, and loyalty to others who are, are on the team. Yes. So it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a commitment to uh, uh, one another. Now, the importance of loyalty is that without loyalty, um, you don't have unity. And it is unity that commands the blessing. Psalm 133. And, and I tell you, uh, a church can withstand unit, uh, disunity at the lower level if there's unity at the leadership level, if there's loyalty. A church can stand anything. If a church can hold together as a leadership team in loyalty, then it's a strong church. Mm. The difficulties come when loyalty at the senior leadership level begins to unravel. This is why I'm talking to you about it. And this is why you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's an important thing to consider as a, as a, as a, as a leadership team. Um, when I say that I expect loyalty from my team, I'm not saying that, that I'm surrounding myself with a whole lot of yes men mm. or people who are just going to do what I want them to do. I'm not talking about blind allegiance. Um, it's okay to have a different opinion, or right? a contrary opinion, but what you can't have is a contrary spirit. Mm. And I read this from a leadership article, uh, which I thought was really good. It says, healthy dissent is not disloyalty. So I'm not saying that you can't even disagree with your leaders. I mean, that's not the point. Um, if leaders expect their people to feel a sense of ownership, of loyalty to decisions taken, they must allow people into the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, loyalty is, is uh, not really something that can be demanded, uh, but um, it, it uh, is something that can be cultivated and, and created by your own leadership style. So, so by involving, you know, your team, your key team anyway, in your leadership decisions, uh, gives them a sense of ownership and, and buy-in uh, and enhances a sense of loyalty. Now that doesn't mean to say that um, you know, they uh, have to um, agree uh, all the time, but what it does mean is that in the end, after having some input and you as the senior pastors make the decision, um, they buy into that decision. They will do that if they've had the opportunity to have the input and to take their views into consideration. I think it's just an important little technique in understanding because a lot of leadership style today tends to me to be very autocratic and very dictatorial and it's kind of like I'm the, I'm the senior pastor, I'm the boss, you know, if you're, I'm the connect group leader, do as I say. You know, submission in the church is always voluntary. So it's not about lording it over the people. It's about persuasion. It is. It's very much about winning people. Uh, Amen. I, I just, it's just a little thing that I have at the moment because I see such hard leadership sometimes. Uh, you know, where people you know, do as I say or else. You know, that's not, that's, not, that's not loyalty. That's not building loyalty. That's just manipulating. <laughs> and coercing uh, people. But loyalty is something that's cultivated by involving people in the decision-making process, or at least giving them an opportunity to be heard. Mm. Okay, you don't have to, you know, hear or receive everything, but at least give people an opportunity to be heard. But irrespective of that, when the decision is made, they follow the leader. So the whole contrary opinion thing is fine, but it's when you've got a contrary spirit. You're not on the same page in terms of spirit. Now, the thing about loyalty is that it can only be tested when there's an opportunity for disloyalty. Mm. So, how do you, I mean, I mean it's, it's easy to be loyal when we're all in agreement about something 
and it's all going the way that we want it to go. But what if it's not? Yeah. See, that's when that's when you decide. That's when you discover whether you've got loyalty or not. Yeah. And uh, see, Jesus said this to his disciples. This is Luke twenty-two verse twenty-nine. He says, "You have remained true to me in my time of trial, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in that kingdom." And you will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the tribes of Israel. Now that's eschatological. That's to do with the, you know, the, uh, the new age. But the principle is very, very clear there. What Jesus is saying is, look, even when it got tough, even when there were times when you felt you may not have agreed with how it was working out, you still stuck with me. You stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So because you're loyal. All right, I'm going to give you greater responsibility and greater authority in my new kingdom uh, when it uh, comes. So do you see there how loyalty is an important thing, not just for the working of the church, but also for your own, the development of your own ministry journey? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Faithfulness in little things ends up with faithfulness in the big things. So if you can be trusted with a little, you can be trusted with a lot. See, who does the boss promote at work? The ones who are faithful. The ones who are loyal. The ones who are just doing it and getting it done. You see, same, that's a kingdom principle. That's why it works that way. And that's, that's, that's what we need to understand uh, in, in, you know, in the church as leaders. We need to be followers. We need... Uh, to be able to come under authority. Mm. If we can't come under authority, mm. we will never have authority. Yes. It's just, just how it works. Yeah. So I'm, look, I'm talk, talking to the Connect with leaders now, or the yes. young people's leaders, or the worship leaders. Yes, right? amen. Because you, know, you have teams, you expect those teams to you know, maintain a loyalty to you and, and what you're doing. So there's Pastor Stan and Helen. You would expect that. God would expect that. It's, it's a kingdom principle for the for the blessing of the church, because it preserves the unity of the church. Now, here's some of the uh, the things we, we we were talking about. This um, never never find yourself um, falling into these uh, uh, traps, uh, because you know sometimes we just like to make our point. Uh, we like to advance. Self, uh, what we never want to do is betray trust. Right? So, don't be a leader who betrays trust. The trust is given to you. You've been called to ministry leadership. The call, as we've discussed previously, has come from God. We know that. Right? But God has delegated that trust or revealed that trust, revealed that call to us and delegated that authority to us by those in the church who are already over us. So God's used, you know, if you're the connect group leader, God has called you to be a connect group leader, you know that. But God has used Stan and Helen to actually affirm that call. They've been his agents for the delegation and appointment of that authority, or the recognition of that authority. Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So understand that uh, there's a, a sense of responsibility that goes with that. Uh, you have been entrusted with a ministry gift uh, through your leaders, Stan and Helen. Yeah. So you have a responsibility before God and before them to exercise good stewardship of that gift entrusted to you. Very, very important. And if you want to be a good leader, who will be a blessing to the church and a blessing to your people, and who will advance in the kingdom of God in terms of responsibility, Amen. you need to really appreciate that one. Yes. Because if you don't appreciate it, sooner or later it's going to come unstuck for you. And remember, this is all about you know being in there, going the distance, you know, long term. Yeah. I mean, at least do a year. <laughs> You know, these people who come out, sign up for leadership stuff and then pull out after three months or something or other, you know, they're the highlights. 
I mean, you've got, you, you know, they're in it for themselves. It's got too tough, you don't want to pay the cost. But mm -hmm. anyway, we, 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 we want you to stick. And aside from all those other things, this whole important of being someone who is able to follow, who is able to remain loyal mm -hmm. uh, to those who are over them, uh, is a very, very important principle. Yes. What you never want to do is bite the hand that actually feeds you. <laughs> you see, and stand in hell, not the ones who have fed you. God has done it, but he's done it through them. So you've got to honour that and, and respect that, and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to betray that trust that has actually been given to you uh, by a wrong attitude or by not fulfilling your responsibility properly and adequately, by not exercising good stewardship of the task that's given to you. So. What if the calling of, um, the calling of God um, follows by with something that uh, causes the betrayal of trust? You know what I mean? In other words, the leader over you has... has uh, no, like what if you're a leader yeah. and you received a calling of God kind of thing. And, um, but the calling of God, the telling you what to do, yeah. um, interferes with the betrayal of trust. Like, like it goes along with the betrayal of trust. I'm not quite sure. So it goes along with the trust. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, so for example, like maybe you have to leave to go somewhere else. Or, yeah. Oh, okay. So, okay. So you you interpret for me. Um, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's like he's already a leader, yes. so there's like that trust that he's gonna be there and continue with yes. his yeah. stuff that he's. Yes. And then, and then he has a call from God to go somewhere else. Oh, I see. Okay, so oh, all right. Along okay. that line, not not it's not not no. like oh, in other words, specifically going somewhere else. But like perhaps something that the leaders above you wouldn't want you to do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So the leaders above you wouldn't want you to do. Okay. Well, you know what? Yeah, that's a very. No, 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 no. Is, is this just about the leaders above you, or no, it's about people you. who trust you as well? Yeah. Well, you've got to be trustworthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't betray your trust, the people entrusted yeah. into your care. I, I would think, if I'm trying to understand the question, but, but if what you're trying to say to me is, I'm halfway, I'm, I'm fulfilling a ministry, and then I want to go and do something else? Is that what you're saying? No. So, uh, so you say that a calling from God yeah. uh, calls him to betray his other's trust. Not on purpose. Not on purpose, but indirectly. Indirectly. Yeah, indirectly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think, no, I don't think, I, that's, that's a contradiction. It yeah, well, yeah, God calls you to, to follow. So you, you, you have to be committed uh, uh, to follow through on the task that's been entrusted uh, to you. If, some, if you feel that you've been drawn off in some other area, then your responsibility, I mean, one, one thing, you would need these over you in regard to that. I think that's one of the indicators and I'm not, not, not just talking about you know, just one person, but, but if you felt that God was leading you to do something else, you would want that confirmed by those in authority over you. If, 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 if your own pastor says, you're saying, look, I feel called to go to um, Africa to be a missionary, and your pastor says, well, you know, I don't quite see that yet. I appreciate what you're saying, but at this stage, you know, my, my encouragement and guidance to you would be to continue to follow through and be faithful to the tasks that you've got now. And when you've, followed, when you've completed that, let's reevaluate that and see, you know what I mean? And you say, oh no, I'm going anyway because I feel God's called me. Then I think probably you're out of order. Probably. <laughs> I think probably... Is that what you, I, don't know, I don't even know if I'm answering no. the question. <laughs> no. but, I thought you were saying, Robert, are you saying that if you... So, plain and simply, if you're obeying God, you know you're going to do this, but it upsets somebody else. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> he's talking about a relationship context. A friend, yeah. I mean, a, a friend. Oh, not just, just someone a friend, too. Yeah. Yeah. Friend. Oh, a friend. You're not talking about those over you. No, or both. No. Oh. Or you could say both. Like, oh, well, so. I mean, no, no, no I'm talk we're talking about, you, in this context, we're talking about following those who are, who are over you. Okay. Yeah, but that would, um, could work that way as well, since, like, let's say, the leader about you doesn't like what you're doing or something. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that can happen. 
I, I, well, that's it. Okay, now, 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 now I'm actually with you. Okay, you're, you're appointed to do something. You're feeling, you're feeling like God's called you to do something else. You go and you talk to your leader about it, and your leader says, no, I don't see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Is that what you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're saying? Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, by and large, by and large, if God is calling you to do something, yes. and you're right about that, God will also reveal that to your leader. Yes. By and large. Still be a it would be. It would be if you were to. Um, uh, you know, take action that was contrary to the oversight that God has, has, has put over you. I, you know, I would think so. I mean, if, if God's really calling you to go to Africa to <laughs> to be a missionary, then my response to that is well. God, please reveal that to Pastor Stan. Yes. Let him see that. Let him show that. Mm-hmm. Let him understand that. Meanwhile, meanwhile, I'll continue to be faithful. I will complete what I have done here. See, that's the thing. I think a lot of people bail when things are half finished. You know, uh, Pastor Stan, I'll commit to the worship for a year. And then three months later, God's calling me to go to <laughs> Africa. But hang on, didn't he call you to commit to the connect group, you're know, the worship for a year or whatever. You, you know what I mean? You know, as, as he suddenly changes mind. So, so follow. The whole thing is following. Look, let, you know, our word is important. And you know, being faithful to our word. I mean, it's the whole thing of loyalty. Um, let your yes be yes and your no be no. There's so much hedging around. You know what's really frustrating for pastors? It'd be frustrating for any of you who are leaders. You know, people who say, I'm on your team. You can rely on me. You can count on me. And they don't show up. And what's worse, they don't even let you know they're not showing up. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? So you, you, on the day, well, where's so and so? You know, mm. man, that's that's not good stewardship, is it? That's not good followership, is it? That's rebellion. That's just doing my own thing. Yeah. I'm not coming under authority. I'm not disciplining my life to to f- fulfil responsibility that God's given to me. I'm my own spirit. You can't team teams are never going to work like that. There's got, to be, there's got to be that commitment, commitment to one another. Yes. And that willingness to come under authority, that willingness to submit, that willingness to serve, and that willingness to actually stick at it, the willingness to fulfill the responsibility that's been entrusted to you, to follow through on the commitment that you made. That's the big problem in the world today. Nobody's got any discipline, nobody's got any commitment. Mm. Church has to lead by example there, and the church won't work unless there's that kind of Kind of so okay, God's calling you to be a missionary in Africa. All right, well, fulfill the first call. Be faithful in that little thing, and then He'll give you the wherewithal to be faithful in the in the bigger thing. I've seen that happen. I've seen people go, oh, nah, I'm called to bigger things, and they take off and it all implodes and collapses. Doesn't work out. You never see them again sometimes. So no, finish what you started. Just to be difficult. Yes. <laughs> um, what if it's connected? What if it's connected? Yeah. Connected. In what way? Like that's good that one thing that you're already doing yeah. is connected with that. Well, that's all right. It doesn't mean to say you bail. You finish what you're doing. And then you... <laughs> no, it's like uh, it's supposed to be worth it, I guess. Like, you just didn't finish seeing the whole picture. You began following God like by faith. Yeah. Like, start. Yeah. But as you're going on, yeah. and um, because you didn't yeah. see the whole picture. Yeah, well, we don't often see the whole picture. Yeah, so. Well, you still finish what you're doing. You've got, to, you've, got to walk, you've got to take the path one step at a time. It's not a matter of from, like, here I am here, now I'm going to take a big jump to over there. You take it one step at a time. What's that? There's a problem somewhere, isn't there? Path of, what is it? What is it? The path of the righteous. Yeah. Something about. Path of the it becomes increasingly brighter. You, you know, if you take, if yeah. you take, what's that one? Uh, I can't, I can't remember it. Becomes clearer. Clearer, clearer. 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 Yeah. yeah, like the. In other words, you take each step. You know, the the ultimate destiny begins to unfold. But just because you see where you're going, you can't jump from here to there. You've still got to take the steps. So I would still think. I'm still thinking. I don't think there's any way around it, mate. You're just going to have to. 
complete <laughs> what you've given yourself to before you move on to Africa, all right? Yeah. <laughs> that would be, I mean, seriously. Um, people, oh, that's one of the biggest frustrations in the church, you know, for it's, it's leaders not committing to and sticking to the task that they gave themselves to and, and that was entrusted to them. It's saying, oh, God's called me to do this, and then halfway through it's saying, oh, no, now I'm called to do that. That doesn't make sense to me. So I think in the normal scheme of things, I'm not discounting that possibility, but in the normal run of things, God would require you to be faithful in that thing that he's given to you and see it through to the finish before he takes you to the next thing. Cancel that ticket, mate. <laughs> Cancel the <laughs> Now, here's another thing. I'll, 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 I'll talk about this too. So you're a connect group leader. All right? Don't abuse the influence that you have over other people. See, all of you who are, are leaders will be leaders of teams. You will have influence over other people. Uh, because you're a leader, you will be a gatherer. It says abuse, abuse of influence. These are traps. These are traps. Don't fall into these traps. Don't betray trust. All right. Don't 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 uh, get into abuse of, uh, of 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 influence. You see, what can happen is this. You know that people can be attracted to you. You know. You know how some connect groups or small groups are bigger than other groups, and uh, you know some people have this ability to attract. Um, I mean that's you know that's a, that's a wonderful thing, but you know a, a loyal leader will be aware that these people have been entrusted into his care, and the responsibility for their care has been delegated, uh, you know, to them by their by their pastor, by their oversight. Um, a leader who has a wrong attitude or a wrong heart or wrong motives can abuse that power by uh, influencing those people to become his followers apart from following the leaders of the church or the vision of the church. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. This is how church splits uh, begin to happen. And uh, nothing is more devastating to a church than to have somebody who has been given the authority of leadership in the church, who has influence over people, for that leader to actually betray that trust and negatively influence those people in regard to them leadership or the, or, or the church and take those people uh, out of the church. Uh, so, the, the, and I'm saying, you were thinking, I, I would never do this. Well, I tell you, there's a lot of people who, who said exactly that. And, <laughs> and God has, you know, blessed their ministry and they've got a little bit above themselves and decided that they know how to do things better. That's how church splits happen all the time. So, so you know, Guys, never be one of those people. In, in, in my experience, you know, people who do that inevitably fail in what they're doing. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, I'm thinking about a situation right now in one of our churches over the last three years, there's been, or four years, there's been about three occasions when strong leaders have risen up. They've led, you know, small groups or connect groups, and they've, they've, they've had their own agendas, the leaders, they've not been faithful. And they've pulled those people out of the church and tried to start another church. Now that's been devastating for the church, but in all of those situations, none of those groups have survived. You see, what I mean? it, it's, it's, it, God's just, just, you know, I've never really seen it blessed, that kind of thing happen. Usually the group will stay very small or, or it will dissipate uh, altogether. I just think you can't contravene the principle of being faithful to that. Uh, which God has given to someone else, or which God has actually given to you, under under somebody else. Uh, examples in the Bible, you know, around that, um, you know, Absalom and David. Absalom wanted to be king. He he influenced the people. He get alongside people and say, "Ah, oh, yeah, the old man is not doing a good job, is he? If you if I was the king, I would have handled your case a little bit differently. I would have done it this way." And it says that. Um, uh, you know, he carried favour with the people. And uh, the Bible says in 2 Samuel verse 15, in this way Absalom stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. 
So, uh, you know, you all know what happened to Absalom. In the end, he was defeated. Now, here's a good thing for Pastor Stan and Helen, and this has been an encouragement to me, because, you know, you know in my church now, um, I'd only been there two years. Um, the church, the previous pastor had burned out. The church had entropied. It was dying. Finances were in bad shape. People were leaving. It, it, it was just a terrible thing. When I came in, when the new guy came in on the block, you know, everyone got excited, and, 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 and the church rallied, and, and it grew for the first couple of years. And then I had some people in the church, uh, previous power base, you know, the pre, you know, part of the previous leadership, who decided they didn't like some of the things that I wanted, wanted to do. Uh, in fact, one of the things was, you know, in one of the meetings there was a power manifestation of God, you know, somebody was set free from a demon. I thought it was a Pentecostal church. These, the, these, le these leaders got upset. You know, well, we don't want this kind of thing happening in our church. The, this guy, one guy actually tried to call a meeting to, you know, to get people together to have me removed. This is after a... So you think, you know, you think you've been... Uh, yeah. Uh, that was terrible. Because, uh, you know, so, and this is a guy who was actually part of the, part of the leadership. And he decided, he was actually one of the associate pastors, and he decided that he could, you know, oh, we, we should do things different, differently. So he was betraying the trust that, um, uh, you know, that I continued to give him. Which was a continuation of the trust that he had uh, had uh, uh, previously, but I'm not sure where I was quite going with that. But the point the, the point is, he was a guy. This guy was actually called to ministry leadership, mm -hmm. uh, a very good, gifted guy, but you know, he's never gone there. He's not the church anymore, of course. But <laughs> um, I had another guy who w was on my team, and I went. You know, he preached, and I came back and I said, "How'd it go?" And he says, "Oh, they liked my vision." <laughs> they liked my vision, and uh, and that was the first thing that I got. That this guy was not a faithful follower; that he was actually betraying the trust delegated to him, and he's beginning to abuse the influence that he had over yeah. over the people. All right, they liked my vision. Now, you know, in the end, uh, that guy was exposed for. His real heart motives, and he has he has a desire or had a desire to be in the ministry. He wanted to be in ministry. I had given him that opportunity, yeah. but because of his disloyalty, because he began to show after that that he was actually quite critical. So in the end, um, I actually stood him down. That's hard to do. It's easy to appoint people. It's not so easy to actually stand them down. And there was there was there was actually challenges, you know, around that. Now where I was going with that though is. It's Stand if that is ever to happen. This is what David did. Um, David's response was this when he heard about his own son Absalom trying to take the kingdom and heard that all the people were with him. He says, If the Lord sees fit, he will bring me back to see the ark and the tabernacle again. But if he is through with me, then let him do what seems best to him. So, in other words, David's response is a really profound example to any leader facing a challenge to leadership. He didn't resign himself to the relinquishment of his kingdom without a fight, but neither did he desperately cling to it. Ultimately, he completely trusted God with it. So this comes back to that first session on call. Mm -hmm. See, when a leader knows God has called and appointed him, he knows that God will also hold secure uh, that appointment. So that's just a little thing for you. And, and I hope, pray, that you never have to face that in your ministry experience. But just be aware that it can, it can happen. My appeal to the guys here today who are with you and your leaders or emerging leaders is never ever be that person. Mm -hmm. You be faithful, you stay loyal. I'm not saying you have to agree with everything, but, but what I am saying is that let your spirit stay on the same page, that your heart stay you know, with, your, with, with your pastors and with your leaders. You be faithful, mm -hmm. you, you just follow through and uh, maintain that that principle of loyalty and commitment to what has been delegated to you mm. by God through them. And I tell you what, your ministry will be a joy. Your ministry will be a blessing. Mm. The church will be blessed as a consequence of that kind of, that kind of loyalty. Mm. Don't be a betrayer. Mm. Don't be impatient for promotion, is another one. Right? So don't be a betrayer. You know, some people I don't. They, don't be impatient.
patients for promotion. Is it my drunken so experience by writing again? It's another trap you can fall into. Now I'm not saying everyone does, because not everyone feels the call to, to you know, take on more leadership responsibility. Some people are very happy being number two, number three, number four on the team. So that's fine, and they're comfortable in their place. But there are people who, you know, have a genuine call of God in their lives to go further than that. And, uh, but in the meantime, they're number three or number two or whatever. Well, the whole principle applies. Be faithful where God has put you. Do the job well, and ultimately, um, you know, the opportunity will open up for you. Uh, you don't want to be impatient about that. You've got to allow God to do it. Now, someone who wanted more leadership in the Bible was Korah. Remember Korah? Korah was the one who, you know, he had a, he already had a responsibility in the, in, in, in the temple, but he, he wanted more responsibility. So he challenges Moses' leadership. In fact, he goes to Moses at one time and says, uh, uh, you know, you've gone too far. <laughs> you know, you're too bossy. You're too... <laughs> Who do you think you are, Moses? Uh, everyone in Israel has been set apart by the Lord. You know, we're all ministers. We're all, you know, and he's with, he's with all of us. Um, you know, so, so, so Kura is always a, a kernel of truth in every lie. You know, it is true. You know, all the Lord's servants, we're all, we're all set apart. We're all the Lord's servants, we're all set apart. But we're not all called or set apart to do the same things. The thing with Kura was that he wasn't, satisfied with the particular position that he was given uh, you know, to serve in the temple. He wanted greater authority and greater prominence. And so he, again, you know, got into this trail of trust because he was uh, anxious for promotion. And if you know the story, he ends up going down a hole. You know, everything just, you know, just caves in.